Newspapers. All the great cities in the world now have newspapers, but newspapers as we know them today are not that old. The very first newspapers began long after the invention of printing. They started in Europe in the 1600s and were usually only a couple of pages long. For a long time, newspapers were not very common. Governments didn't want public discussion of their policies and decisions. Often, they closed down papers or taxed them heavily. The stamp tax on newspapers and pamphlets was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Newspapers began to grow in size when they discovered advertising as a source of income. Nowadays, advertising is the main revenue source for most newspapers. As newspapers became more widely circulated, they could ask for more money for their advertisements. By the late 18th century, newspapers were in common use in Europe. The 1800s and early 1900s was the golden age of newspapers. Improvements in transportation, communication, and printing processes made it easier to collect news from near and far and to publish papers more quickly and more cheaply. The Weekly Dispatch and the Times, both of London, England, were leading newspapers through much of the 1800s. The Times was one of the first papers to include illustrations. It was the first newspaper to use a steam engine to turn the presses. When the tax on newspapers was reduced in 1836, the Times was able to increase its size considerably. In 1840, it began to use the telegraph to collect news stories. In 1855, the tax on newspapers was finally lifted. The Times made its greatest reputation during the Crimean War between Britain and Russia. British armies fighting in Russia's Crimean Peninsula were not only unsuccessful in the war, but were suffering severely from illnesses. The Times sent out the world's first war correspondent, William Howard Russell, in 1854. His reports from the battle lines had a powerful effect on the British public. A war fund was organized to help the soldiers. Russell forced the government to accept the offer of Florence Nightingale to organize nurses to travel to Crimea. A photographer, Roger Fenton, sent back photos from the war, which were published in the Times. Meanwhile, in America, a more popular approach to newspapers had developed. The newspaper had spread west with the pioneers, and nearly every little settlement had its own paper. American newspapers were cheaper and livelier than British ones. They were aimed at the average person rather than the governing class. Examples of the new style of editing and publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, especially, employed sensational and emotional writing, which aimed at stirring up the public to action. Hearst is sometimes accused of starting the Spanish-American War of 1898 with his overheated editorials. Nonetheless, his methods were successful in raising circulation and were widely imitated. The modern newspaper contains more than hard news. In fact, news may be a fairly small part of it. Advertisements, gossip. Show business, photos of celebrities, sports, stock market prices, horoscopes, comic strips, weather reports, and much more are found in its pages. The modern newspaper is a total entertainment package. A question for the future is whether electronic newspapers will replace paper newspapers. Paul Kane, frontier artist. Since Christopher Columbus first met American Indians in 1492. Many Europeans had been fascinated by Indian life and culture. As a result, there was a demand in Europe for drawings and paintings of Native Americans. European artists who had never seen an Indian supplied most of this demand. But in the 19th century, several painters traveled into Indian territory to make an authentic record of Native life. One of the first artists to do this was the American painter George Catlin. In 1841, Catlin published a book of his work. Catlin's work helped inspire another important frontier artist, the Canadian Paul Kane. Paul Kane was born in Ireland in 1810. His family moved to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, when Paul was nine years old. The young boy was not very interested in school. At that time, there were still Indians living in wigwams in the Toronto area. 
Young Paul liked visiting the Indian village instead of going to school. Since Paul spent little time in school, he was largely a self-taught artist. He also became a surprisingly good writer, considering that he had not spent much time studying spelling or grammar. After working some years making and decorating furniture, Kane was ready to travel. He spent the years from 1836 to 1841 living and traveling in the United States. Then he traveled in Europe from 1841 to 1843, studying the great painters of the past. He was back in the USA until 1845, and then he returned to Toronto. Immediately upon his return, Kane headed into the wilderness areas around Georgian Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Lake Michigan. His plan was to sketch Indian life before it disappeared forever. American Indians were dying so rapidly from European diseases such as measles and smallpox that many people believed they would soon vanish as a race. Their culture was threatened too. As white settlers demanded more land, Indians were being herded into small pieces of land called reservations. Here they could no longer practice their traditional way of life. Kane wanted to capture Native American life while it still existed. Kane returned to Toronto at the end of 1845. He had received one good piece of advice, and that was if he wanted to travel into the wilderness, he would have to go with experienced people. He was able to get the support of the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Sir George Simpson. In May 1846, Kane joined the annual canoe fleet of fur traders going west. Kane would travel all through the wilderness areas of Western Canada and northwestern USA. During this time, he made hundreds of sketches of Indian life. Although Kane faced incredible hardships during his travels, he was able to see what he wanted to see. He was able to take part in one of the last great buffalo hunts and killed two large bison himself. Traveling west with the fur traders, he visited many forts and trading posts. He saw and painted a prairie fire. He shot a grizzly bear at close range and killed several wolves that attacked his horses. He learned to travel long distances on snowshoes in winter. Finally, he arrived at the Pacific coast, where he made some fine drawings of the West Coast Indians. European diseases had reached there just before Kane. Fifteen hundred Indians had died near Fort Vancouver in the summer of 1848. One wealthy chief had ruled one thousand warriors and had ten wives, four children, and eighteen slaves. Now he had only one wife, one child, and two slaves. Kane had not come too soon. However, there were tribes still unaffected by Western culture and Western diseases. Kane also traveled widely around the Columbia River in northwestern USA. Everywhere he went, he sketched Indian chiefs and scenes of native life. On his return trip, he encountered a large war party of fifteen hundred braves on the warpath against their traditional enemies. He was able to sketch the leading chief, Big Snake, who was later killed in single combat during the battle. When he arrived back in Toronto, Kane gave an exhibit of his sketches and watercolors. Most of the rest of his life was spent turning these drawings into finished paintings. Remember the Alamo. The first Europeans in the American Southwest were Spanish explorers and conquerors. They were followed by religious orders that set up missions to Christianize the Indians. One of these missions was San Antonio de Valero. It was founded in 1718 in what is now San Antonio, Texas. Later, the mission structure became known as the Alamo. In 1821, Moses Austin had persuaded the Spanish authorities to give him a charter to settle 200,000 acres in Texas. The elder Austin died shortly after this. Five weeks later, his son Stephen Austin traveled to San Antonio to have this charter confirmed by the Spanish governor. In 1822, Austin led 150 settlers into Texas. When Austin learned afterwards that Mexico was now independent of Spain, he journeyed to Mexico City to have his charter reconfirmed. The Mexicans appointed Austin regional administrator for his colony. Texas grew rapidly. Cotton farming and cattle ranching were profitable and attracted American settlers. By 1830, there were 16,000 Americans in Texas, four times the Spanish-Mexican population. Sam Houston had been a successful soldier and politician. He was a friend and supporter of President Andrew Jackson. 
However, personal problems and political difficulties led him to leave the USA for Texas. Meanwhile, the struggle for control of Mexico had been won in 1833 by Santa Anna. However, the independent thinking of the Texans infuriated Santa Anna. He had Stephen Austin thrown in jail and sent an army into Texas. Austin was released from jail in time to organize the defense of Texas. The Mexican army was besieged inside the Alamo and, after fierce fighting, surrendered. The Mexicans were allowed to go home. Sam Houston was now elected the state's supreme commander. Not long after this, Santa Anna approached Texas with an army of six thousand men. Houston decided not to meet Santa Anna in open battle, but to wait for an advantage. He sent frontiersman Jim Bowie to the Alamo. Bowie's orders were to leave San Antonio and destroy the Alamo. When Bowie arrived, however, Texas volunteers were preparing the Alamo for a siege. Bowie and his men pitched in to help. Other volunteers came. The fiery William Travis arrived with twenty-five men. Then the famous frontiersman Davy Crockett came with a dozen Tennessee sharpshooters. When Santa Anna attacked, there were one hundred eighty-three Americans inside the fort. Santa Anna brought up cannon to bombard the Alamo. As the walls began to crumble, four thousand Mexicans attacked from all four sides. The Mexicans overcame all resistance because of their large numbers, but they suffered very heavy losses. All the American defenders were killed. While the battle was raging, the Texans back at the colony declared their independence from Mexico. Sam Houston now gathered men to fight the Mexican army. At first, he retreated while waiting for a suitable opportunity. When Santa Anna's rapid advance left the bulk of the Mexican army behind, Houston prepared to fight. Santa Anna's advance troops moved into swampy land by the San Jacinto River. Houston's men attacked while the Mexicans were having their midday siesta. Their battle cry was, "Remember the Alamo." The battle was soon over. Many Mexicans were killed, but only a couple of Texans were killed. Santa Anna was a prisoner. Santa Anna readily agreed now to recognize Texas as an independent republic. Ninety years later, in 1845, Texas became the 28th state of the USA. Louisa May Alcott. New England in the early and middle years of the 19th century had a flourishing culture. People were passionately interested in ideas and education. Most New Englanders were strongly opposed to slavery. They were also concerned about other social issues. New ideas resulted in new kinds of writing. These ideas included the importance of doing what seemed right for them, no matter how different it was from what other people thought. People also believed that nature gave them guidance in our lives, and that it was important to live close to nature. These and other ideas were expressed through teaching and writing. Bronson Alcott was one of those who looked at the world in a new way. He looked for work as a teacher so that he could pass on his ideas to others. However, very few parents wanted Mr. Alcott to teach their children, and very few people were interested in hearing his speeches or reading his books. As a result, the Alcott family was very poor. Fortunately for Bronson, he married a very capable and energetic woman. Mrs. Abigail Alcott helped to earn money to support the family and did most of the work involved in looking after the four Alcott girls. The oldest daughter, Anna, was quiet and serious. She rarely got into trouble and was a good helper at home. The second daughter was Louisa May Alcott, who became a writer. She was adventurous and cared very little for rules. She was always saying and doing things that got her into trouble. The third daughter, Elizabeth. Was very kind and good-natured. All the others loved her. As a young woman, Elizabeth had a severe case of scarlet fever and never fully recovered. She died at age twenty-three. The youngest sister, May, was talented, but she was rather spoiled. Because there was never enough money, the Alcott girls felt pressure to work at an early age. But this did not stop them from having fun. Louisa wrote little plays that she and her sisters performed at home. They all enjoyed the woods and ponds around Concord, Massachusetts, where they lived most of these years. When they moved back to Boston in 1848, Anna took a job looking after other people's children, and Louisa looked after the house. 
Meanwhile, their mother worked outside the home. While working on laundry or sewing, Louisa was thinking up stories. At night, she would write them down. When she was 18, she began selling poems and stories to magazines. Within 10 years, Louisa was earning a substantial income from writing. One day, her publisher suggested that she write a story for girls. At first, Louisa didn't like the suggestion, but when she started to write, the ideas came rapidly. Her book was based on her own family and her own childhood. Little Women was published in 1868 and was an immediate success. The March family was very much like the Alcotts. Mrs. Alcott resembles Marmy. Meg is like Anna, and Joe is like Louisa herself. Beth is based on Elizabeth, and Amy on May Alcott. Many of the situations in the book happened to the Alcott family. Nonetheless, many characters and incidents were invented. Little Women and its sequel opened up a new kind of writing for children. While these books did have a moral, they were more lively and interesting than earlier children's writing. Little Women inspired many writers later to write more realistic accounts of childhood. Niagara on the Lake. Niagara on the Lake is a little town at the mouth of the Niagara River. It is only 12 miles north of Niagara Falls. It used to be true that very few tourists would bother to travel from the falls down to Niagara on the Lake. Nowadays, however, the little town itself is a major tourist attraction. The town has a remarkable history. The area played an important role in both the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. As a result, the little town has two forts: Fort George and Fort Mississauga. When Fort George was reconstructed for the public in the 1930s, Niagara on the Lake got its first big tourist attraction. Because Niagara on the Lake was the first capital of Ontario, it has many significant firsts. There was the first parliament in the province, the first legal society, the first library, the first newspaper, the first museum building, and many more firsts. Besides its history, the town, which is bordered by Lake Ontario and the Niagara River, has beautiful scenery. On a summer's day, visitors can watch the sailboats going out the river to the lake. On the land side, Niagara is part of the fruit belt of Ontario. Peaches, pears, apples, cherries, and strawberries grow here in abundance. There are also long rows of vines, and winemaking has recently become a major industry. The mild, humid climate allows plants to flourish. The trees, especially the oaks, grow to remarkable heights. Flowering trees and shrubs perfume the air in the spring. Gardens are often spectacular for much of the year. Because of this, Niagara on the Lake attracts many painters and photographers. Many of the private homes also have a long history, and great care is taken to keep them looking their best. The biggest single attraction is the Shaw Festival Theater. The festival was founded in 1962 by a group of Shaw enthusiasts. Early productions were often held in the historic courthouse on the main street, and plays still take place there. In 1973, however, a new 861-seat Shaw Theater was built at the south end of town. Since then, traffic to Niagara on the Lake has been steady all through the long summer season. In 1996, Niagara on the Lake was voted the prettiest town in Canada. Partly, it is the scale of things that makes the old town so attractive. The old town is only about eight blocks long by eight blocks wide. It has a population of little more than 1,000 people. Nonetheless, there is a lot for people to do and see. There are many interesting shops, old hotels, bookstores, art galleries, museums, a golf course, a marina, historic churches and cemeteries, several parks, three theaters, and lots of restaurants. Because it is small, Niagara on the Lake is a good place to walk around or bicycle around. There are also horse and wagon rides. Although the main street can be hectic in tourist season, one doesn't have to go far off the main street to get in touch with an older, slower time.
Most of the downtown buildings haven't changed much since the days of Queen Victoria, and tourists can still imagine that they are back in the days before computers and television. Pocahontas and John Smith. In 1606, King James of England approved the establishment of two colonies along the eastern coast of America. The northern colony in Maine lasted only a year. The southern one at Jamestown in Virginia became England's first permanent settlement in America. In 1607, the Virginia Company sent 104 settlers to Virginia. The settlers lived in tents all summer. By September, more than 60 were dead because they lacked good food or water. The leaders of the colony were not energetic and did little to make the settlers find food. One member of the company, Captain John Smith, was determined that the colony would survive. Smith pressured the colonists to build huts, a storehouse, and a church. He made daring trips to Indian villages, demanding that they give the settlers food in return for beads and copper. He threatened settlers who were trying to leave the colony and go back to England. On one of his trips to the interior, Indians attacked John Smith. They killed his two companions, but captured him alive. He was taken first to the local chief. This chief was impressed by Smith's compass and spared his life. His captors dragged Smith from village to village. He finally arrived at the town belonging to Powhatan. Powhatan was a great chief for all of the tribes in that region. Powhatan and his advisers talked about what to do with Smith. Suddenly, Smith was dragged forward, and his head was pushed against a stone. The warriors raised their clubs to kill Smith. Then Pocahontas, who was Powhatan's twelve-year-old daughter, begged for his life. Her words had no effect, so Pocahontas ran to Smith. She took his hand in her arms and laid her own head against his head. Smith was released and went back to Jamestown. Soon after Smith returned, one hundred new settlers from England arrived. It was a very cold winter, and in January, Jamestown was accidentally set on fire. The settlers suffered from cold and hunger the rest of the winter. Every four or five days, Pocahontas and her attendants came. They brought food for the hungry settlers. Even so, half of them died. In the summer, John Smith explored that part of the coast of America. He made a map that would be very valuable for future sailors and settlers. On his return, Smith was elected leader of the colony at Jamestown. However, some settlers did not like having to follow rules. Some encouraged the Indians to try to kill Smith. Chief Powhatan agreed. He also refused to supply food to the colony, hoping to starve them out. Pocahontas warned Smith about the plot against his life. Smith had to fight off several attempts to kill him. Finally, the colony seemed to be growing, and the Indians became peaceful. But in late 1609, Smith was injured in an explosion and returned to England. Pocahontas remained a friend to the colony. She married John Rolfe, one of the settlers. In 1616, she traveled to England with her husband and son. There, she saw John Smith once again. She was so surprised to see him that she was unable to speak for several days. Pocahontas had believed that Smith was dead. The following year, she died and was buried in England. Pocahontas's love for Smith and Smith's determination to fight for the colony had saved Jamestown and given the English their first colony in America. Plains Indians. The best-known picture of an American Indian is a warrior in buckskin riding a horse, wearing a headdress of eagle feathers, and carrying a spear or bow and arrow. This is a picture of a plains Indian. And it appears in many Hollywood westerns and on the American five-cent piece. There were many tribes of Plains Indians. For the northern American prairies or plains stretch from the northern forest of western Canada down to the states of Oklahoma and Texas in southern USA. It's interesting that our image of the Plains Indian is only true for the last couple hundred years. It was not until the 1600s that Plains Indians began to ride horses. There were no horses in America until Spanish soldiers brought them in the 1500s and 1600s. Some of these horses escaped and ran wild on the prairies of America. It was these wild horses that the Plains Indians learned to tame. Before they had horses, the Indians hunted buffalo on foot. Buffalo were huge bison or wild cattle which traveled in very large herds. A big herd might have millions of buffalo. 
It was difficult to cross the prairie because these animals blocked your way. The Plains Indians had various ways of killing buffalo. Before they had horses, Indian hunters would quietly creep up close to the herd. Then they would fire their arrows together. There was always the danger that the herd would stampede and trample the hunters. Another method was to drive the buffalo over a steep cliff. There are a number of places on the plains where this was done. Once the plains Indians had horses, they preferred to hunt buffalo on horseback. When the tribe started to use guns, they could kill many buffalo. Artist Paul Kane describes a buffalo hunt in the Red River Valley in 1846. The hunters carried their bullets in their mouths so that they could shoot faster. They could ride right into the herd, shooting at close quarters. They would drop an article of clothes on the slain buffalo to mark it for themselves. Then they would continue the hunt. After the hunt, the Indians would skin the animals, and the women would dry the meat and store it in fat. A single hunt might kill more than thirty thousand buffalo. The Plains Indians received nearly everything they needed from the buffalo. Of course, they used buffalo meat for food. They also used the buffalo skins for clothing, blankets, and the covering of their teepees. These teepees were cone-shaped tents, which were easy to put up and take down. The Plains Indians were nomadic and followed the animals they hunted. Since these animals were plentiful, Plains Indians usually led a comfortable life. They developed complex religions and social rituals, as well as specialized societies or clubs. There were also rituals and customs for hunting and warfare. Many Plains Indians fought hard against the settlement of the Great Plains. The American government discouraged the hunting of buffalo because without the buffalo, the Plains Indians would not be able to fight. With the buffalo disappearing, the Plains Indians had to give up fighting and move into government-sponsored reservations. Gribio. Saint Francis of Assisi, who lived in Italy in the early 13th century, was known for his love of animals. He was the first person who celebrated the birth of Jesus by gathering live animals around a manger. He often talked to the birds as he traveled along. Sometimes the birds would fly down and sit on his head, shoulders, knees, and arms. But the best-known animal story concerns Saint Francis and the Wolf of Gribio. Saint Francis was known for his humility and his unwillingness to hurt anyone. Once, when one of his followers spoke harshly to some bandits, Saint Francis told the man to run after the bandits and apologize. In the same way, Saint Francis thought of animals as his brothers and sisters. Once, when he was warned about some dangerous wolves, he replied that he had never harmed Brother Wolf and didn't expect the wolf to harm him. While Saint Francis was staying in the hill town of Gribio, he heard about a large, fierce wolf. The townspeople were terrified of this wolf and had eaten both domestic animals and humans. Saint Francis decided to help the people and went out to talk to the wolf. The people watched in horror as the wolf came running to attack Saint Francis, but the saint made the sign of the cross. Then he said to the wolf that, in the name of Jesus, it should stop hurting people. The wolf then lay down at Saint Francis's feet. Saint Francis addressed a little sermon to the wolf. He recounted all the terrible things that the wolf had done, but he added that he wanted to make peace between the wolf and the townspeople. The wolf nodded its head in approval. In return for the wolf's agreement to keep the peace, Saint Francis promised him that he would arrange for the townspeople to feed him. When he asked the wolf never again to harm any person or animal. The wolf nodded again. Then the wolf put out its paw as a sign that it would keep its promise. The wolf walked beside Saint Francis back into Gribio. When a crowd assembled, the saint preached to them about how God had allowed the wolf to terrify them because of their sins. He told them to repent, and God would forgive them. Then he spoke of the promise that the wolf had made, and what he had promised the wolf in return. The people agreed to feed the wolf regularly. And the wolf again indicated that it would not hurt anyone. Again, it put its paw in Saint Francis's hand. The wolf and the people kept the agreement. Two years later, the wolf died. The people remembered how it no longer hurt anyone, and that not a single dog ever barked at it. The townspeople of Gribio lamented its death. Whenever it went through town, it had reminded them of the virtues and holiness of Saint Francis. Summertime, 
In North America, July and August are holiday months. Most schools and colleges are not in session then. Families look for activities to keep the children amused. Although not all workers get a full two months of holidays, most people take a holiday in the summer. The summer begins with a national holiday. In Canada, July 1st is Canada Day. In the USA, July 4th is Independence Day. A lot of families are soon on the road. Some travel to cottages by the lake. Some go sightseeing or camping. In Canada, especially, the summers are short, so people try to make the most of them. In much of Canada and parts of the northern USA are woodlands dotted with lakes. These regions of rocks, rivers, pine trees, and wild animals are not usually suitable for farming. However, they are ideal places to spend a summer holiday. They are far from the cities. The woods are quiet and peaceful. People fish, go boating or swimming, have barbecues outside, or play outdoor sports. Some people spend their whole summer at the cottage. Others go for a week or two. City people who don't have a cottage like to go to parks and swimming pools in the city. If they are near a lake or ocean, they may go there for the day. Many museums, libraries, and art galleries have programs for children in the summer. Swimming is probably the favorite summer sport. It feels wonderful on a very hot day to jump into the cool water. Swimming is also excellent exercise. Besides swimming, baseball and football are also popular in the summer. Spending an afternoon or evening at a baseball game is a favorite summer pastime. Summer is also a favorite time to catch up on reading. Stories of adventures and love novels are favorite light reading. But summer is especially a time for traveling across the country. Some people have a camper or trailer that they can live in. Some stay in campgrounds and sleep in tents. Others stay at hotels or motels, while others rent cottages or cabins for a week or two. Most trips are by car. Many people visit national parks and other wildlife areas. Of course, trips along the ocean and the lakes are favorites. Along the Atlantic Ocean, the coasts of New England and Canada's maritime provinces are especially popular. On the Pacific coast, tourists travel from California all the way up to Alaska. Boat cruises along the shores of British Columbia and Alaska are especially popular. Of course, some people find it most relaxing just to stay at home. Others cannot afford to travel. If you have an air-conditioned house with a television, video player, CD player, and computer, then it can be very pleasant. To stay at home, a lot of new movies are released at the theaters in the summer. Air-conditioned theaters with new movies and lots of pop and popcorn are favorite summer places. After two months of summer activities, most people are ready to go back to school and work, but they usually have lots of happy memories to take back with them.